in the ICO space, uh, the valuation, once, once an ICO starts being traded, it's not like an IPO. Uh, when an IPO finally goes public, the company has been around for a long time, and the data of that company Amy, is actually... Sorry. 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 Uh, and the data of that company is actually public. So there's, a lot of, so there's actual fundamental analysis goes on. I mean, sure, uh, traders will also, you know, pump that company, but the underlying principle of an IPO is the company has revenue, usually, uh, and like in the case of Facebook, in the beginning it really didn't, but by the time Facebook went IPO, they already had revenue. Uh, so most companies go IPO, they already have some revenue, and they have open books. Uh, when it comes to an ICO, the point is to get your ICO on an exchange and to get it trading as early as humanly possible. Uh, there's also maybe about a dozen or two dozen people capable of actually understanding whether the project that you're doing is actually you know, sustainable, legit, technologically stable, and those people aren't looking at your ICO. Um, so the reason why the price is so volatile of these ICOs is there's completely no, um, there's no regulation in the space, there's no requirement, there's no banking requirement, there's no age requirement. I've seen 12 and 13 year olds uh, pump these things uh, through chat groups and troll boxes. There is really no logic to it. It's just like, what do they want to pump? So I'm happy to jump. Uh, can you hear me? I'm happy to jump on this also. I think uh, the token or the coin uh, is a barometer of your community. If you have a great community, a thriving community, a growing community, your coin is going to go up. Look at Ethereum as an example, right? Uh, that coin value continues to go up, well, until recently, uh, because the community was growing. So another driver that I think is very important is uh, what is your utility token, right? I mean, what's the utility in the token? Uh, if you look at Filecoin, for example, right, where you have people who have storage, people who need storage, and the coin is being used to exchange value between those people, uh, the fact that there's an exchange and it's also trading the same coin or token uh, is a secondary issue, right? So it has its own engine that is turning around. So when you're designing your uh, project, it's very important that you think about these things and you incorporate that into your solution. Many people just think, oh, I'm just going to raise money and then whatever happens, happens. If I'm lucky, there's going to be a lot of people who buy the token and it's going to go up in value. If I'm not lucky, it's going to crash. Unless you're creating that demand and the token economics, it's just not going to happen by itself. So you're seeing the most successful companies designing that into the architecture and building that into the future so they could basically uh, build a community and expand on that. Very much so. Very much agree. The community, I think it's the, the key aspect here, right? A lot of the ICOs that fail is because they don't have a community or they haven't planned ahead. Right? Think about it. In the traditional terms, if you're starting a company, you would take money from an angel, VC, a fee, and then you would have weekly calls with them and say, hey, here's the funds that I got, here's I'm using the funds, here's the progress that I made. With an ICO in crowdfunding, you're not taking the money from them, you're taking the money from the crowd. Right? So you have to be somehow connected and responsible to the crowd. So I have you know, weekly AMA, uh, constantly engaging with them on social media, events, in person. You know, BEF here is a great example, right? It's an opportunity for a lot of people in the space that have startups and ICOs to engage with the community, with the public. Um, so it's a great venue for that. Um, and a lot of other events out there, there's, an, there's another opportunity for that. But in, in essence, this means engaging with the community, caring about the community, doing the things with the community in mind. Um, and, and, and then you're going to be rewarded if you care about the community, right? If you don't, you're going to fail. So to me, as, as Alex said, community is number one. Number two is I have 300 plus white paper that come through my desk on a monthly basis, OK? And 99.9% .9 are crap. And the reason why they're crap, there's no business logic. There's no business sense behind it. You ask one of the CEO how you're going to make money, and you know the answer that you get? Through the ICO. That's not sustainable, right? So there's no business sense behind it. There's no, there's no sustainable thinking of how to run a company, how to hire people, how to grow and scale, just like in a traditional term. So to me, community and the business sense, the business mechanics are the two fundamental elements and the reason why ICO either fail or they 
go to the moon. Uh, that's actually how I've always seen Ethereum and every copycat of Ethereum uh, when I first heard of it. That's pretty much the, it's the same model. The model of application tokens, I mean, that, it's not the community of Ethereum. It's the fact that right now Ethereum has people convinced that they need to build their tokens on top of Ethereum, and that's the use case for Ethereum to build, to replicate Ethereum's way of raising funds. That's not going to last. Uh, you actually need a use case. and An application token never makes sense in any product. If an application token made sense, we would all be paying Amazon stock for Amazon products. It just doesn't. And you know, we, we talked a lot about community here, so I just want to kind of separate the different pods of communities. Uh, you have the developer community, which might be excited about your infrastructure or project, and they might want to be joining the open source uh, you know, mission that you have. You have the investor community. If you make them happy and they invested early on, you made them a lot of money, they're going to be your diehard fans. They're going to talk about your company in, in a way which uh, you know, is, is very unique. Um, you have your partner community. These are you know, strategic partners that might have uh, you know, uh, a stake in you, know, you succeeding. If you succeed, you might actually help disrupt that business model and create efficiency and decrease costs for them. Um, and finally, you have your ambassadors. And these ambassadors are just uh, the techies that are really interested in actually disrupting those certain sectors. So, uh, you know, when, when an ICO has to focus on a community, I think they have to break this down and, and, and really, uh, you know, uh, align their, their mission and, and, and their statements towards each pod. Um, and I think, you know, collectively that creates what, what we see with things like Ethereum and, and Bitcoin uh, being the original, uh, the, the forefront of this. Um, and, and going forward. So I think a lot of the ICOs here that are looking to launch can learn from that, um, kind of break it down and put it into their roadmaps. There's obviously other, other things as well that I'll, I'll hit on later, but that we can all hit on, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna say something completely, completely contradictory to all these people, and they may Love get that. mad at me. When you have a token, you're actually launching a new economy. This is a paradigm shift from what we've thought of before. We're no longer selling equity and future earnings on a discounted cash flow, which is what a stock is. We're selling pieces of a new economy that doesn't rely on profits. So what happens in the US or what happens in Singapore when you grow the pie, which is GDP in that standpoint? You actually, the only way to earn money in those particular economies is to gain dollars or to gain Singapore dollars. Now, we don't think about Singapore, about growing Singapore and then selling Singapore for some future liquidation value. So this is sort of the mind shift that I think that a lot of these coin companies are trying to move towards, except everyone else is still stuck in this old paradigm of saying, uh, I'm thinking about earnings, I'm thinking about stock prices, I'm thinking about equity, I'm thinking about how this utility token works. And I think one of the first use cases is maybe pre-selling my gift cards, right? So Ethereum is sort of selling these gift cards of Ethereum tokens that give you access to their transaction network. I think that as more and more companies start thinking about things in this new paradigm shift, you're gonna see real ICOs come out that create new economies and new ways that we view things that go away from the standard capitalistic stock method to more of a community-based true economy. And we don't know what that looks like in the future, and that's what makes it super interesting for innovation. So that's my whole stance on this. Well, we, I think we all agree. No one here disagrees with that. The problem is that most of the projects, there's about 4,000 projects out there, including the ones that get out and everybody else who published the white paper. Most of those have nothing to do with a new economy, right? So, or creating a new economy. So, again, the token in that new economy represents the value of the community. So, we all agree with what you're saying, but the project has to solve a big problem in which you can create a new economy, right? So. The hardest thing for most people is to come up with that idea. Something completely new. For example, if you think about the open ledger, open uh, blockchain, which is Bitcoin and Ether, uh, the exchange of tokens is the killer app, right? The, the ability to exchange tokens between two people with everybody else agreeing who got, gained one and who lost one, right? That is the killer app, and that's a new economy. Now, can we build other values on top of that, right? What are the other building blocks that could be built on top of these foundations 
to expand the, uh, the economies, to expand these new economies. And what we haven't done in 10 years is we haven't come out, besides ICOs as a way to raise money, we haven't really had a single killer app in the entire ecosystem. And what's happening is that we're wasting a lot of precious uh, dollars, well, in this case, precious uh, Bitcoins and Ethers on projects that are not really helping this new world, this new paradigm shift, but rather trying to fix the banking system or the healthcare system or the, some other system, right? Because we're taking blockchain and we're injecting it into the old world. And that's not what we should be doing. Crypto Kitties. Crypto Kitties, yeah. <laughs> That's a killer app 2017, CryptoKitties. Yeah, that's Does really anyone have one here? Us. Average price $126, made $11 million the first two days. I think that's an interesting application. That is definitely scalable. I mean, I, I can see all of us just investing in that. So, you know, and gaining, wh where are the next 100 million people gonna come to, right? I mean, right now there's about 35 million wallets. We need, you want these coins to go up in value? You need 100 million or a billion people to join and adopt this new economy that we're all talking about. So they're not gonna come for crypto kitties. They're not gonna come uh, for, again, for us flipping coins to each other. You need real world applications that allow these people to improve their lifestyle, to join the middle class and do things that they do every day in, in, a, in, a, in a closed system, right? Because right. the dollar system or the yen system or the euro system does not allow them to do any of these things. Right. So I, I have to say, so I don't understand any of that. Like, I, I don't understand what that means, right? Like, for one person, uh, it could mean something completely different than another person, right? I mean, this sounds like one guy knows exactly what the world needs, and that's not true. Uh, we already know Ethereum is not immutable. The chain was rolled back after the DAO. Uh, unfortunately, that you know, did not take down Ethereum. I'm still not sure why. I was 100% certain that it would. Uh, the Bitcoin blockchain solved a problem. It's a, it, it, ha it has a use case, solved the problem. It gave us a way to send digital data and lose possession of that data. Now, people still don't comprehend the, how powerful that is. Uh, it was a computer problem that was not solvable until Satoshi solved it. He solved it with a mechanism called proof of work. Uh, basically gave people the ability to send a digital message and lose the possession of that message. It so happens that the most useful application of this uh, technological innovation is using, using it as money, using it as uh, value transfer. Um, that property is only useful in very small cases, uh, especially when it comes to censorship resistance. Uh, we now have the ability to pay each other in a censorship resistant way, and that solves certain problems. It lets you get around certain jurisdictional laws. Like if your country doesn't allow you to gamble, you can now gamble. If your country doesn't allow you to do other voluntary contracts, you can now pay for them digitally online and know that your payment is pretty secure and it's pretty safe and it's not counterfeit. This, um, now, he needed something to, he wanted to name this thing something. So in the code, he happened to write the word blockchain. And in, in, in his initial writings, he wrote the word time chain. The way he described it wasn't really important. The innovation was proof of work. People ran with this word blockchain and now I don't know what the word blockchain means. To me, blockchain means proof of work, immutable data transfer. Uh, but people seem to think that putting an Excel spreadsheet as a Google Doc is a blockchain. It's not, it's just a database with multiple administrators, those that you assign as administrators. And um, the point is that this application allows you to store your digital data in a way that no one else controls it but you, and you have the ability to accidentally delete it permanently. And this does not apply to things like real estate. This does not apply to things like medical records. Because uh, the only reason to put medical records on a blockchain is if you want the accidental ability to permanently delete all of your medical history. Look, we all want to access our medical history from the click of a button because I've never met a doctor that I liked and I've switched doctors probably a dozen times. I just go to them randomly. So I would like to have one place to show the new doctor that data and have it be secure, but that does not need to be on a blockchain. 
Uh, you know, you can just go get a bunch of people from Estonia that managed to like digitalize their country uh, and just put some encryption on it, right? It can be stored safely and securely and in a centralized way. Uh, there's a big difference between decentralization and security and privacy. So that's what I really want people to walk away with. Can, can I give a one world uh, application that applies to every human on the planet? Uh, today you give the bank some money. They give you 1%, 1.5%. They take your money and they lend it to the next person on the credit card to 25%. Okay? If you had a community, you could take all that profit, give half of it to the lender and half of it to the borrower. Right? And you could do that on a blockchain, on a public blockchain, with everybody as a community contributing either as a lender or as a borrower. Okay? That's a, an example of an application where 7 billion people are going to say, I'm in. What's, what do you charge me? Three, four, um, you pay me three or four percent interest, you're gonna charge me seven or eight percent interest, I'm in. No, right? but so I, I, yeah, and so all those Pablo, people, uh, people finish, are gonna lose their I money. They're second? all gonna lose their money this way. No, they're not gonna lose their money because it's all asset backed lending. Just like today, I borrow from uh, US institutions at less than two percent. Why? They hold my uh, stock as collateral. Here, they can hold your crypto as collateral. So the loans do not have to, there's no reason in the world why you're paying 20 something percent on your credit card. It's just that the largest bank in the world decided, because they're monopolies effectively, that that's what they need to charge. From, a, from an economic standpoint, if you have an organization whose purpose is not profit, as, as you said before, but whose purpose is to serve the community, then the difference between the lending and the borrowing is almost zero. If you have a large enough community, the lending and the borrowing would be within half of 1%, and the community will decide what is the cost of that borrowing. So all of this exists today. It just works only for rich people. Rich people don't, I'm one of them. Sorry, I'm rich. But this is about taking all of that. It applies to the very rich and applying it to every person on the planet. And all of that is possible if we break the rules. You want to break the rules? Create a new economy. You want to create a new economy? Use the, block, the open blockchain. So this is not about technical issues or anything else. It's about a new business model and then applying the technology. I'm a technologist, and I'm telling you it has nothing to do with technology. It's about breaking those rules and applying them in a way that has not been applied before. It's very much aligned with, I think, what... Hello? It's very much aligned with, I think, what you guys are saying as well, right? What Emma was actually bringing up earlier on, right? It's about creating a new economy, a new model, a new system. New economy. Right, which which takes time, right? So I, I think I you know I, I heard a lot about like we're not ready or the se sectors are not ready for this kind of technology, but we're forgetting that it takes an average of three years for software to mature uh, in a regular sector. Now bring in a sector that needs uh, a that has a huge demand for blockchain developers and not enough developers to meet that demand, and combine it with a bunch of projects, and then say, oh well, they're not ready yet. I mean. Of course they're not. It's going to take a long time. It's new technology. It's, you know, there's going to be a lot more applications that we haven't thought about yet, that we haven't discovered yet. Um, so I, I think you know we have to give a little bit more, uh, you know, patience and, and uh, a lot more belief in, into this to to really advance to the levels that we think we can get to. Um, I mean, I can debate that all day, but I'll just comment on one thing. For the love of God, please don't let anybody ever hold your crypto as collateral for anything. I don't agree, but I'm going to say something is it took 20 years. Like I, I have been on the internet since I was, um, it's been over 20 years now that I'm in the internet. And when I first used the internet, it was a portal. Actually, I was really young and I used a BBS because I have an electrical engineer. Has anyone been on a BBS bulletin board system? Yeah, I was a little kid. I was tinkering away at a computer because I have a degree in electrical engineering. I like computer science. and. It took from BBS to today when I can buy something, buy shoes on the internet around the world from my phone. It took 20 years. Now let's just say we went lightning speed and we went 4x exponentially fast that. That's five years. How long have we been in blockchain? I mean, Bitcoin came out in 2008. It's been 10 years since Bitcoin was even introduced to the point that we actually know about it. So that's 10 years. Think about how long it will take for the next. And I think that all the projects that happen today, um, I think one of them this year in 2018 will become the crypto kitties this year. And then it's going to be an exponential explosion of the next Google and Facebook. And we can never predict the, 
business models of Google and Facebook becoming the media leaders of today. The way that we cannot predict what a blockchain technology enhanced company will bring to our tomorrow. So I think that everyone here, you know, you should all buy into ICOs, buy as much as you're willing to lose, keep buying into crypto, and um, you can let other people hold your collateral because frankly, I don't trust myself holding my own money in my own mattress. I trust my American government, I trust my American banks, and I trust my president and my government. And so, you know, that's me. But a lot of you guys, you know, everyone has different uh, preferences. Um, but I definitely think everyone should just buy crypto. And with that, you know, thank you for your time. Yeah, and I, th I think we're still trying to kind of figure it out yet. You know, as Emma said, like, we, we're, we're not there yet. It's like very much the early internet days, right? When you read some of the, the white papers nowadays, it feels like people are, are trying to, to kind of create another YouTube. But when it's 1992, when you had a dial-up, which doesn't make sense. So we're still trying to kind of figure it all out. We haven't yet, so we'll get there. Uh, <clears throat> So, what I see, there are two types of projects which perform well. First type is a protocol, it's uh, like new blockchain, and now in trends in Samsung, which connects different blockchains, Lightning, which speed up blockchain, Atomic Swaps, it's, it's a trending protocols. And uh, we see projects which have only white paper and bunch of developers. Some of them have history. And their history plus protocol now means several billion valuation. Check Miota and so on. And second type of projects which also hits billion dollars valuation. I, I mean the tokens. Uh, something like products which immediately generate, uh, generate either profits or generate burning of tokens. For example, uh, Binance or KuCoin, uh, they kind of accept tokens as a payment for listing on their <coughs> exchange. In some time it costs several hundred thousand dollars. They have a trick, they put an auction. <laughs> you want to get listed? offer your kind of money, but pay us in our tokens. So you go to exchange and buy their tokens to pay them for listing and this drive price up. It's two billion valuation in three last months. They don't have protocol, however, they have mechanics which burns tokens. Uh, are there any other cases which result in billion valuations? Other projects, I think they like just following because investors relocate. They s decide that Bitcoin is too high. Part of them kind of sell it for Tether or for dollars. Another part is uh, selling it for Ethereum. That's why Ethereum now relatively high, at a record high. Then it kind of splits to another hundred and top 100 and 200 projects. And third value driver is if you are on the top list, if you are on the radar. <laughs> That's what I see. So if you have high valuation and you are on the radar, then you will automatically move with the market. If the market is rocketing, they, you rocket as well. Even if there is no business yet. Or I mistake again. <laughs> Uh, Amy, you disagree with everybody. Now you agree with me. Huh? <laughs> I feel lucky today. Um, so, any questions, please? Come on, you should have more energy than we. We yeah, drank too much yesterday. Okay. All right. Yeah, I wonder if I could just um, steer people a little bit back on track. I thought this was about why ICOs go stellar. Uh, or kind of plummet uh, to uh, under the force of gravity. And it seems like we've got a whole background on the theory of uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin and blockchain. And I'm just wondering if the panel's got a view on why ICOs often uh, kind of plummet to, plummet to earth. Well, if you, if you sold your, uh, to if you did a lot of raising of money and you gave everybody a 50, 60, 70% discount and you didn't have any lockup, Guess what happens when you listed, right? They're all trying to exit the doors at the same time. 
So the plummeting is, is an indication of how much trust those token holders or coin holders have in your project. If, you, if they have zero uh, uh, trust or zero expectation of the price going up, they're all trying to get out at the same time. Pro other projects that, that have a lot of promise or have a lockup, which enables the company to prove that they can deliver things, right? Give them time to make announcements, show partnerships, deliver the product, show that it's actually working, right, on testnet or livenet and so on. Uh, uh, their, their tokens have a better chance of going up. So a lot of this has to do with how the company was structured from the beginning. It's not just magical and there's no reason behind it. I mean, a lot of this ICO shouldn't, shouldn't be an ICO in the first place. Like we, there's a lot of noise because there's a lot of speculations coming in, which is good from an innovation standpoint, right? That's how innovation happens, right? When, when, when you have a tons of people coming in and, and trying to kind of, you know, either make a bug or trying to figure it out, and a byproduct of that is going to be the Amazon, the Google, the Facebook of the future, right? That's, that's what we've seen in history in the past 200 years. Um, yeah, a lot of these ICOs shouldn't be there in the first place, so. I mean, the, sorry, the, the regulation on getting money from other people for your project. I mean, these regulations have been around for a long time. I mean, it's a combination of 100 years of law, of securities law, the Howey test, um, a lot of other laws that have come around and we've now settled on the IPO system. Now, Ethereum allows you to get around those laws on how to basically fund your company. And I explained it in the other room where you end up in a situation where your project is uh, getting like $100,000 in investment because it's all that really deserves, but someone else with a similar project, a lot, you know, no developers, no nothing, but a fancy ICO uh, is getting hundreds of millions of dollars. And you end up in a situation where you also have no choice but to ICO and join the company uh, and join like, like your fellow people. Uh, eventually this would end, this will all end exactly like the dot-com bubble. And uh, this is how everyone ends up in groupthink because everyone has to ICO because their competitors are going to ICO and if they are printing money and if they are issuing unlicensed unregistered security, <coughs> why shouldn't you? Um, and, then, like, and then if everyone is doing it, then everyone can't get in trouble. Uh, so how big can this get before it all goes to zero? It, it, it's really impossible to say. I mean, it's, it's all luck of when you predict a bubble. I mean, will you get out on top? A uh, few people did in, in the dot-com days. We'll see. So you, you were asking uh, more about how certain ICOs are going stellar, right? They're increasing it. Yeah, and that's kind of what the topic is as well. So uh, I want to touch up on that. Um, I, I think there's a, a lot of things in between that. The foundational level pieces like, you know, the legal side and, you know, speculative side and the other things we discussed. But beyond that, you know, if an ICO decides to launch, um, there's a couple strategies they can follow. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the successful ones that I've seen, uh, some infrastructure projects that are over a billion dollars today, uh, what they did was they got some very strong advisorship and that advisorship branched out into many areas. One is token economics, so making sure that the utility of the token would make sense in the future based on what they're really solving and how much it would cost. Uh, many other details around that. Beyond that, I think uh, they had some extremely strong marketing teams because at the end of the day, you could be doing an amazing project. You could have an amazing team. Everything could be in place. Your token economics, great. Uh, but, you know, your go-to-market strategy might, might not be so great. And if you don't have a strong marketing team, nobody knows you, you exist or what you're trying to accomplish. So you're not going to get that community, whether it's on the developer side, the investor side, ambassador side, and so forth. And, you know, what we've seen in this is it's a lot to do with community. You know, the crypto community is extremely strong, small, and uh, powerful. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, to, to answer that question, uh, th there's many, many criterias. Um, but, you know, I, and exchange listings as well is something we talked about, right? Liquidity. I mean, at the end of the day, if you do an ICO and, and a lot of investors invest, but then they can't sell, well, you know, there goes your community. I mean, so um, that's some of the things that I wanted to touch up on. I hope that's uh, helpful. Yeah, it's just very much like a company. Sorry jumping in, but it's just like a company. Like, why company fail? Why startup fail? They don't have the, the right team, right advisors, enough money no product market fit, and ICOs on top of that, you have the, the use of the tokens. So that's what Alex and I and the rest of the panelists were saying. There's no community in terms, there's not enough people to use the token because the, the, there's no need for it, right? They haven't been able to say, hey, you know, why are you buying a token, right? 
Uh, you know, I was giving a presentation this morning, right? Ask yourself the basic questions, right? Why am I doing an ICO? Why am I even using blockchain? Why a token? That's the reason why. Hi, my name's Troy, I'm from Australia. <coughs> I'm part of a number of ICO groups in Australia and we've seen a number of the groups there. We've got a lot of friends in there. We invest in different ICOs, you know, maybe one a week, two a week for lucky to get in through the whitelist. And it's all about the coins. There's been no real community in a lot of it because half the people just invest in whatever the, the group says is a good idea or they think it's going to get 10x, 20x, 100x. I think that's going to have to change pretty quickly because um, as we're seeing now and we've seen in the past, um, you know, the massive volatility is going to be a major issue for confidence in this area. I've got my mother telling me at 65 pre-Christmas to buy up in that Bitcoin was going to be the best thing and then after Christmas with the dumb saying, get out, I told you so. So we're seeing, you know, different community sentiments now with people saying it's all popped and everything. But I think with Alex, he's got the key there. Because I'm a very big advocate of cooperatives. And I think the cooperative model of creating communities should be the new focus for ICOs, to create the stability and create the utility in the tokens and, and to create that use there. Um, what, what's your comment or feedback on that? <coughs> I agree with Alex. You know, I'm just kidding. It's, it's <laughs> Look, again, I, I think unless we find the next 100 million people to join the community, we're not going to have a recovery, right? We're already starting a nuclear winter, okay? Think about it that way. So we have a Cambrian explosion, now we have a nuclear winter, right? So now people are kind of nervous. They're saying, okay, should I sell or should I stick around? Am I going to huddle or I'm going to buy more, right? And it's... The, the, solu the answer to all of this is not about all of us buying more coins. The answer to all of this is finding every one of us is to find 10 people to join the community for a good reason. I'm not saying ask them to buy coins. I'm saying let's support the right projects and invite new people to come in into the right projects to create real communities, real solution, like, for example, a replacement to banks that enables uh, people that are unbanked or underbanked to basically join the middle class. And, and that is only 4 billion people on the planet. It's not a big population, you know, that are underbanked. So, so these are applications that are dying for uh, a solution. And the blockchain, the, the, the public blockchain is perfect for it. It's a financial application. It's per use of uh, uh, open ledger plus a consensus plus an uh, 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 open uh, uh, blockchain is exactly what this is uh, designed for. But unless we all get together and, and solve that and create that, uh, we're going to have a nuclear winter. So maybe someone should put a vote out to the crypto community to change C and ICO for community, not coin. I like that. Well, the, the other thing you said that was good is that, you know, a lot of these projects, uh, they, they don't want to really uh, attract the speculators, right? because speculators don't understand the technology. So the thing you're mentioning is like, you know, all these people saying, oh, it's gonna do a 10X, 20X, 30X, that's, it's called consensus. And, and like, you know, a lot of that consensus is behind people that are just driven by greed. They don't understand the technology. They haven't even looked at the website or the project or the white paper or the team, anything. They're just following their peers. And that's, uh, you know, speculation, that's where speculation comes from. And they don't understand. So. When, when the token goes uh, 30x or what, whatever, when it goes higher in price and it dips, you know, it, it, everybody starts selling, um, I think that's why it's, that's happening. Because the people that truly understand where, where this thing can go um, are the true believers of it. And that's what ICOs really, that's what projects really want, want you know, at the end of the day. They don't just want speculators. So. That's, a, that's something we have to solve as a community. That's, you know. I think it's about users. Um, when you had Google start um, with Larry and Sergey out of Stanford, and I remember my first time using Google, someone said, use Google. And I said, what is this Google thing? And I looked at it and I said, what the hell? There's just one line when Yahoo has all these like links and I can do all these things, and you want me to use Google? OK. So I plug in something to Google, and I was like, oh, it gave me exactly what I wanted. It didn't give me a bunch of junk. And then every single time I said, oh, let me use Google. And I got my friends to use Google. And then pretty soon they had these AdWords. And then pretty soon I had a small business. And I was like, OK, well, I don't need to pay $10,000 to have an ad. Maybe I just pay 10 cents whenever someone clicks. 
Right, so these are sort of like user-defined activities. Well, the token economy now, no one's actually using the tokens for anything except for buying and selling on Binance. And that's why Binance's model, Binance has gone up significantly because a lot of people are actually using Binance and using Binance. I'm using Binance as an example. It's a big exchange, one of the top ones around the world now. Everyone's using Binance. It's a high-use product. It's one of the biggest uh, well-used products out there in crypto. Ethereum, a lot of people are using Ethereum, let's face it, to run ICOs. I mean, that's it, right? So what else do we have use cases for? I'm not sure. I think the more use cases we have these utility tokens, you don't have to convince someone in community to say, buy Bitcoin. They're buying Bitcoin because there's value. My friends on the internet are saying it's 70% off now. Everyone's buying like crazy because they want to put value in. You get value when you have utility, when you have use case, when it solves a problem. I think as soon as we get more utility tokens that solve problem, the community problem solves itself. It's about solving the problems that we have and getting all of you guys to be able to use it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna push back on this because I wanna bring us back to reality. You're not gonna solve anything with the community. Um, if any of you have ever been on the board of your building or on any kind of board, when you have even like 10 people trying to make decisions for 200 people, even those 10 people can't come up with a solution, right? And you want the entire 200 people. Like think of every single person in your building at the same meeting trying to solve a problem, even a simple problem like when should we cut the grass in front of the building. Uh, it's not gonna get solved. Uh, the way these things get solved is by smart people that are experts in that field. You're not gonna build a nuclear reactor by a bunch of Reddit users. You're gonna build a nuclear reactor by nuclear engineers. So the, pro the only way you're actually gonna solve the problem is when the smart people that, are, that fully understand the technology actually build something useful. And in the blockchain space, so far the only thing I've seen where this is happening is in the Bitcoin blockchain. Now the problem with the Bitcoin blockchain is that it's not a company, it doesn't have a leader, it doesn't have a marketing department, it doesn't have a PR department, uh, it doesn't have a fund to promote it and talk down all the other coins, which is what all the other coins and ICOs are pretty much doing to Bitcoin because they have the funding to do so. But all the innovation, all the science is taking place on the Bitcoin blockchain. So I strongly suggest people take a look at what that science is and start comparing that science to any other project in the space. 